guys the last name in this episode. Kara was like, I just need to know how to pronounce it. And I was like, spell it. And she started spelling it. <laughs> she just said, nope. <laughs> Before she even finished spelling it, I was like, oh, no. No, I, no. <laughs> I can't. There's no phonics lesson that's going to get me. Oh, y'all just wait. Y'all can't even, y'all don't even know. <laughs> Hey, this is the Witches, Magic, Murder, and Mystery podcast. And I am Kara. And I am Megan. And I don't know how to pronounce any name in this episode <laughs> except for his first. So, so great. Mm-hmm. Um, Real quick, <clears throat> we wanted to give you guys a heads up that yes. I have a big work thing coming up in June and Kara has a lot of stuff going on. And we've Plus never I really... Like to take random trips. <laughs> yeah. We've never really taken like a planned break. No. So we're just going to take a couple weeks off. Uh, we are planning on releasing a few things, but we won't be recording anything new. And you'll still get your Patreon content. Yeah, if you're on the Patreon, don't worry. We're going to make sure you get your stuff. But the week of June 13th and the week of June 20th, no new episodes. So if you're sad about that and you want more stuff, you can I'm always so sorry. join the Patreon. Because right now there are 26 so many episodes. episodes there. I, look at us. I know. And then I don't know how many videos. I guess however many months oh, the man. podcast has been on Patreon. So there's that. You can also... If you've never watched our YouTube videos, go watch the YouTube videos. They are slightly different than what you hear here because we don't really edit them very much. Yeah. Um, hang out in the Facebook group, share stories with each other. We love you so much, but it we is really going to be do. nice to have a little bit of a break. Yeah. Okay. So you guys, we are here today with... A cod past. A cod past <laughs> episode from um, Kara. Yeah. So I just named it The Imposter and Possibly Killer. The Imposter and Possibly Killer. Mm-hmm. Mm, got it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. What's his name? Oh, I'm so glad you asked, Megan. He has multiple, uh, but his actual birth name, his given name, is Christopher Gerhard Strider. Bless you. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Okay, he is the son of a landscape painter and seamstress. He was raised in Germany and came to America as a teenager on a tourist visa in 1978. So in the 1980s, he's living in San Marino, California. He went by the name Christopher Mountbatten Chichester. Chichester. <laughs> what? Say it again. <laughs> Mountbatten Chichester. Okay, it's really pronounced Chichester. Why? Like, you get to pick. But it looks like. You get to pick a name. Right, but the name is spelled C H I C H E as Chichester. Chester. Again, Chichester. you get to pick your name and you go with that. Yeah, he claims that he was a movie producer. He had mm-hmm. several occupations. He was a relative of Lord Mountbatten, and he was also a British baronet. <laughs> he was a, a British what? Baronet. Yeah, I'm like, why would you claim to be that? He's claiming to be a cardiologist. So you're. What is it? What's a baronet? A Isn't baron? It like, uh, it is hereditary honor that is not a peerage, with the exception of Anglo-Irish black knights, white knights. So it's some sort of or like British, elite. yeah. Okay, so he's British elite, medieval origins, cardiologist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hollywood producer, bond broker. Listen, this is too many things. <laughs> you can't be all these things. Yeah, he finally at the end of his uh, charade. Charade. Yeah, exactly. He claims to be a Rockefeller. Like that's the not, end. Like that's not. <laughs> But that's something that nobody can research and find out. That's the other right. part. Like, well, and that's like the guy that um, the Tindler swindler claimed um, to be related to that, like jeweler or whatever, or jewelry. Ma- I don't remember. I diamond know. person. Well, I can't it's remember. A, but... It's the diamond person. If you guys have seen yeah. the Tinder swindler, I haven't seen it. But as always, I've listened to podcasts that recap it. Yes. And I mean, that guy was good. Yes. Yeah. Scam. Everybody who's like what idiots these women were and i'm like come on now he had a private plane he had bodyguards he had this was a very convincing right con mm-hmm. and i have so many questions so many about questions. the other that girlfriend at the end that had been dating him forever if you all haven't seen it that ended up getting his clothes to sell and sh- so she'd finally get some she got some money back oh that was brilliant. good for her mm-hmm. but what about the woman who got on the airplane with him and there was his baby mama and child who were those people? Yeah. Was she someone in on it? She had to she, have been. Wasn't she his legit baby mama, but she was in on it? I just... Mm, I don't know. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. That's not okay. a day story, but... <laughs> no, but that's another wild ride. Mm. Okay, so when he was younger, he met a young man while he was hitchhiking on a train. The guy said to Chris, if you're ever in Connecticut, come stop by and maybe you can spend the night with us. And so, in 1978, he met an American couple, Elmer and Jean Kellen. 
I think Elmer. Elmer. No. They were traveling through Germany. He decided he was going to use their names to obtain permission to enter the U.S., saying that he was going to go visit them, that they had invited him to stay with them in California. So from there, he made his way to Berlin, Connecticut, where he found a family, the Salvos. I'm horrible with this. (laughs) And they let him live with them. And the U.S. accepted him as a foreign exchange student at Berlin High School in Connecticut in 1979. He told them that he was from a wealthy family in Germany. And they eventually were like, we cannot handle you being here anymore. Like, you are so much. Like, you've got to go. You've that got to You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, the Savos or whatever their name is. Because he lies all the time about everything. Mm-hmm. So then he was like, okay, well, where do I go from here? Oh, oh, the guy I met on the train. I'm going to go stay there. I'm going to go stay with him. So he stayed there for a few months. And Can then, you imagine, like, this guy shows up and he's like, hey, remember how you said I could come stay with you anytime? No, I'm here. Here I am. And you'd be like, oh, oh wait, that was just a casual I conversation. I have got we to were start so- talking to people. We were stuck on a train together. Yeah. <laughs> this is why I don't talk to people. <laughs> yeah. So then he finds a woman to marry him who lives in Wisconsin. Then from there, he headed to San Marino, which is a nice suburb in Los Angeles. And he... Just, like, wanted his green card, so he was just, like, up and left. Oh, no. Yeah. So, Christopher Mountbatten Chichester, Chichester, Chester. (laughs) (laughs) It's a great name. Love it. Rolls off the tongue. Uh Uh-huh. Trips and falls along Um, the way. Was using that name when he arrived to San Marino. That's a very long name to spell. Mm Mm-hmm. There's a lot of problems with it, but that is definitely one. Mm Mm-hmm. So, people said, well... Uh, we welcomed him with open arms. He was very eccentric, but like most people in L.A., he fit in. That's true. If you got to fit, fit in anywhere, it'd be L.A. He moved into a guest house of a woman named Dee Dee. So how? So who's? So God, who, you really this, do have just like... I cannot. Guys. Every ridiculous last name. Yeah. Her son's name was Jonathan Soho. Sohas. While he's living with her, Jonathan and his wife are just feeling a little weird about him. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden, they go missing. Do you think they felt weird about him because he lied all the time about everything? I, you know, maybe. I and know. maybe because no one could pronounce any of the last names that I was providing them. <laughs> So the family said that they received a postcard from Jonathan and Linda. Oh. And it was sent from France sometime after they disappeared. And they were like, this uh, seems questionable. It doesn't seem real. So it's like, like, did they disappear or did they leave? February 8th, 1985, Jonathan and Linda disappeared after telling their friends that they had been enlisted by the government to do some top secret work. Shortly after they vanished, like I said, they received some postcards. And Dee Dee was just like, well, a man called me and told me they were on a secret mission. So I believed it. I didn't want to give any info to police because if they're on a secret mission, police, you know, don't need to know this info. But then she was like, you know what? I'm going to file a missing persons report because everybody's saying that this is really fishy. This is really just confusing to everybody. She's told the police that one of her sources was a former tenant, Christopher Chichichester. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's what I say. So he's just living there the whole time? Yeah. Yeah. But she said he had vanished a few months earlier and he took John's pickup truck with him. But it's so weird that they, like, they told their friends mm-hmm. that they had some top secret work from the yeah. government. What? Yeah. And then, Who are these people? Exactly. So, like I said, he disappeared with John's truck. Three months later, he turns up in Greenwich, Connecticut. I think it's Greenwich. Greenwich. I think. I don't know. I I'm, spelled Greenwich. I'm 100% the right person Greenwich. to, Green- talk, to Green- talk about this. Y'all can correct us later. I think it's where Martha Moxley was murdered. Oh, uh, yeah. So, at that point, he's claiming he's a producer and director of the Alfred Hitchcock Presents, uh, which was, it was a television series at the time, and it was directed by Christopher Crow. So, Christopher, being Christopher, said, oh, easy. my new last name's Crow. Because it's not a common Enough name. Enough with the Chi Chesters. <laughs> I'm now Crow. He decided to get some suits embroidered with CCC, so people were like, him. It must be. It has to you, be him. It's, he's you know how they don't let you embroider no, letters but unless it's just like... Nobody's going to embroider a suit unless you're legitimately that person. Gosh, we were so innocent. So he told people he was on the up and up and that he began to work at the East Coast Financial Institutions. And he went through banks, 
working, just doing his thing, pretending to be a rich little bitch. And <laughs> then early 90s, he decided he was going to start passing himself off as a Clark Rockefeller. I, I just... We all know who the Rockefellers are. Precisely. I, well, if you're the kind of people that know the Rockefellers, then you're e- easily going to know mm-hmm. an imposter, right? Like yep. they learn, they run in a small circle. Yeah. So his friends were like, he has to be a Rockefeller. Like, look at all this expensive, fancy art he has in his house. Like, this is insane. Where'd he get that Nobody... fancy, expensive art? It's fake. Oh, no. It all ends up being fake. Oh, no. Yep. Uh, he dined at private clubs, wore silk ascots, and told people that he worked helping ascots. third world countries manage their debt. Oh, my God. Once again, people described him as eccentric and smart. 95, he decided he was going to marry a Sandra Boss. She was a Harvard-educated executive at a management consulting firm. I just... I mean, I guess back then, it was before... It was before the internet, so you couldn't, you couldn't check things as easily, and there wasn't everything wasn't all connected like there's it is no now. There's no Facebook, and I guess to also see there's five aliases. We just trusted people. Mm-hmm. It's kind of sad that we can't do that anymore, but also uh, maybe we never could. You know, clearly, yeah. yeah. They moved to Boston. They purchased a multi-million-dollar townhouse, and they were living in Cornish, New Hampshire. They New Hampshire, New Hampshire, hamsters. Earlier, the coffee shop smelled like hamsters to me. I guess it was somebody's perfume, and I was like, mm. cedar chips. <laughs> I got that <laughs> hamster cage perfume. It's all the rage. It's the new Kardashian thing. <laughs> Did you own hamsters when you were little? No, I had a guinea pig. They're bottom heavy, and Sophie, so not Sophie, high. Aubrey used to... <laughs> <laughs> that bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Aubrey used to own guinea pigs, and we went through tons of them because she'd just be carrying them, and they'd slide out of her hands, but my parents wouldn't have the just the nerve to tell her that they died because she dropped them, so they'd go get another one. Oh, my God. Um, but <laughs> hamsters get this thing called wet bottom disease, <laughs> and their oh, butts just... I'm not, I think you're on this I'm not mature enough for this. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about like New Hampshire and we went to you, hamsters with you bottom said... diseases. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> okay. They have a daughter named Ray. Uh, she was born in 2001. Uh, he decided he was going to stay home to raise her while his wife, Sandra, Sandra, was going to go support the family with her job. She decided to in 2007 she's gonna file for divorce she's like this is ridiculous she didn't know at this time also that this is not actually who he is she still thinks that he's a rockefeller she just thought he sucked basically Mm -hmm. there was a settlement and she got custody of ray they were married for a decade oh gosh Um, and they just said like the the quote in this article is everything in this man's life was a lie the only real thing in his life was his love of his daughter when he lost his daughter in a bitter divorce he began plotting how to get her back oh no Mm -hmm. so when she filed for a divorce he only got supervised visits very seldomly with his daughter during one of the visits july 2008 he went a little crazy well i'm curious why mm-hmm. supervised visits? Like, what was the... Why did they grant that and not just say you get normal visitation, you know? Yes. Because he must have been violent or threatening in some way. Yeah. Because they don't just do supervised visits for no reason. Yeah. He hires this limousine to take him. He gets to a limousine and he told the driver, his nickname for his daughter was Snooks, that he and Snooks had a lunch date in Newport, Rhode Island with a senator's son that he might need help getting rid of a clingy friend who was a court-appointed social worker. Mm. But the driver driver didn't know that. No, had no clue. They just think, oh, Mr. Rockefeller has paparazzi or something on his back. We've got to take care of him. He was like, the clingy friend's going to try to climb into the limo. We can't let this happen. Like, this is just getting too much. So, he assured Mr. Rockefeller that nobody would get into the car without his consent. Like I said, the limo was $3,000, so the guy thought, well, yeah, this is legit. So, he looked in his rearview mirror, saw Mr. Rockefeller with Snooks on his shoulders, and a guy right behind him. He's like, well, here we go. Rockefeller 
push the person away, set the little one down, pull the car door open, and threw the kid in the car so fast that she hit her head on the door frame. And he screamed, go, go, go. Oh, God. The driver stepped on the gas, obviously, and it drug the social worker who was holding onto the back handles several yards before they let go and fell to the pavement. Let's just take a moment and talk about how social workers do not get paid enough. Exactly. They are overworked. Their caseloads are uh-huh. enormous. Yeah. And yet they go out there mm-hmm. and they deal with people like this. Insane. Within minutes, according to Rockefeller's indictment, he told the driver to pull over. Then he hailed a cab and explained to the limo driver that he was going to take his daughter to the Massachusetts General Hospital. He wants to make sure that she's okay. She hit her head when he tossed her in. He's a little concerned about it. He's got to confirm that she's going to be okay before they go anywhere. He's like, just pull over. We'll be right back in a little bit. Just wait for us. Never came back. So a cab driver agreed to drive him to New York. Or no, not a cab driver. He took a taxi to Boston Sailing Center. Then from there, not a cab driver, his, one of his female friends was waiting for him. She is the one who agreed to drive him to New York in her white Lexus for $500. He was like, hurry, the little one has to catch a train that would get them to a boat launch on Long Island by 8 p.m. Oh, my gosh. So she's like, oh, gosh, yeah, like, she's got to get back to her mom. You only have short visits with her. Sure, totally. Sounds good. How scary it would have to be for the mom. After they arrived in Manhattan, they got stuck in traffic. And quickly, he just scooped up his kid, threw an envelope full of cash onto the front seat, and just ran off with his daughter. The woman's cell phone rang. It was a friend asking if she had seen the Amber Alert concerning Clark Rockefeller's abduction of his daughter. Oh my gosh. And she realized she was tricked into like giving help. him. Now she's uh, helping. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. She realized that, oh, shoot, like this is going to be like yeah. I could be in a lot of trouble. I'm like, an accessory to a felony here. Uh huh. So he, with all of that, I mean, custodial kidnapping, he's also charged with assault and battery by means of a deadly weapon. Uh, which was the limo, um, assault and battery, false names, everything. To the oh, place. against the social worker? Yeah. Back in Boston, ex-wife uh, Sandra was just freaking out, trying to give police all the information. They said, okay, well, can you give us his driver's license number? She said he didn't have one. Okay, do you know if he has a social security number? Nope. Oh, my God. You has have he no way ever to been him. on your tax returns? No. Because oh she was the she one working. working. And he's a Rockefeller. Yep. <laughs> She said all of the credit cards were on my account. His cell phone number is actually, for some reason, under a friend. And every time the investigators would ask her a question about him, she wouldn't know the answer. She had no clue about his identity. She just thought he was a Rockefeller. I will marry you because I love you because money, which the money wasn't even real. So 24 hours well, after and she's the one that worked all the time. Yes. To, get to support him. So, yeah, it couldn't really be that unless it was just exciting to have the name. Right. So 24 hours after his disappearance, Special Agent Noreen Gleason, who was a 17-year veteran of the FBI, she was assigned to the Boston field office. Her first call to the Rockefeller family, she said, they said, under no circumstance is there a link we are not connected. I like that was her first call. Like, yeah. Nobody else had done that yet. Yeah. She's like, just one minute. Okay. Yeah, guys, give me a second. I'm just going to make this one call. <laughs> just, I got to pull a couple Listen, of drinks here. Do you, y'all know Clark? Okay. Yeah. Plenty other people had heard of him. Uh, for five days, Gleason and the battalion of the FBI agents and police officers in the United States and abroad were taken for a ride. Like the limo driver, he tricked all of them, all of the authorities. They said we would start going down one avenue, one lead, and we would get to the end of it, and there'd be nothing there. I think yeah. when you are dealing with someone who lies on this level, yeah. it's like you almost reach a point where you're like, nobody would lie mm-hmm. to this degree. Mm-hmm. Nobody would carry off some big, huge, yeah, extravagant ploy right. to, like, to, I don't, they said that he had a crazy obsession with, oh, man. Hamsters. Is, mm-hmm, exactly. What, what is, exactly. What is that show where they're stranded on an island? Gilligan's Island. Uh-huh. And he was obsessed with, what was his name? Thurston something, something, something. The wealthy man. Uh, like, had a wild obsession with that. Really? Mm-hmm. Hey, guess how they found out who he really is? How? A wine glass. What do you mean? So he, the night before he took off with his daughter, he had a glass of wine at his friend's house. When the investigators arrived there the next day, the friend hadn't washed the glass, so they got his fingerprints off of it. They sent it fingerprint? Yep, they sent it to Quantico in Virginia. Wow. 
Yep. So who was he? Um, well, we already know. Yeah. Already well, she, not she just, your heist meister, Chris Meister. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. No, that sounds right. You're yeah. doing great. Yeah. So while they're waiting for Quantico to process those prints, they put pictures and all things all over the media for people to look and see if they recognize this man. And people call him and be like, I know him as so-and-so. I know him as so-and-so. I know him as so-and-so. I know this man as so-and-so. Wouldn't it be weird, especially if, like, you're someone who was close enough with him that he was at your house the night before having wine. Yes. To realize that, like, everything you knew about him was a lie. Right. Well, like, one person even called in and was like, yeah, that's my friend. He's British royalty. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. When results came back from the from Quantico... They were like, well, he's not a Rockefeller. He's Christian Carl Gerhardstreister. <laughs> exactly. A 47-year-old German immigrant who had come to America as a student in the eight or 1788. Or seven, well, 1978. And, Jesus and he's a vampire. Christ. So. <laughs> so he was apprehended in 2008. Where's his daughter? With him. Okay. So she is safe and fine. 2008. Mm-hmm. When did he take her? July 2008 is when he had that visit with her. Okay. So it didn't take a really long time for them to find her. Right. So the way that he was found, they said investigators got a break. A real estate agent in Baltimore recognized Rockefeller's picture, called the FBI, said it was resembling a man who was on a one poster for $432,000. He said the man previously had paid him with a cashier's check. It was Chip Smith and his daughter Muffy. He said it was a single parent and a ship captain, and he was re- relocating from Chile. Team of investigators surrounded the house. They knew that he was a night owl, and when they noticed that the TV and everything wasn't on, the computer's not on, there are, like, those fake art prints up against windows and stuff. They're like, oh, man, um, this isn't going to be good. Like, we don't know that he's there. They previously discovered his yacht, a rundown 26-foot stiletto catamaran i don't know boats i had one of those ones i bet you did <laughs> but i'm really sad i, I didn't know. get to experience that. i know a lot about yachts yeah yeah, yeah. the um detective said they he kept it docked in baltimore marina two miles away so they're like we're gonna go there so they said they saw a file labeled chip smith and the plans for a new identity that he was setting up so they knew oh, this is the guy So they got the manager of the marina to call Rockefeller on his cell phone and say that his boat was taking on water. And he said, I'll be there. When he got there, an agent in plain clothes said, hey, Clark, where are you going, Clark? He said, I'm going to go get a turkey sandwich (laughs) with his daughter. (laughs) Then they went back to Boston and everybody's like, who the hell is this man? So, yeah, that's how they caught him. People were talking in like before he went to trial or like while he was like in waiting or whatever. They're like he never carried money. He was always like super paranoid about security clearance, like all these things. Like he was a Rockefeller. He was just terrified people were gonna come after him. So he was just super cautious. And the police were like, No, babe. That's no, that's not, not it. That's this not it is at all. Not it at all. Wouldn't it be wild to find out like this man you were married to for ten years and had a child with mm-hmm. you literally know nothing about him. Yeah. It's just Mm -hmm. insane. Then things start popping up. So this quote says, now we're thinking that we're dealing with a person who might have committed two homicides as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were planning on reopening an investigation of the Soho's case or probably the the, the Jonathan and Linda people. Linda, Yes. The government. The disappeared people. Yes. Yes. They're like, you know, these people went missing. We're going to reopen this case now that we know he's associated with them. Yeah, they're just like, well, we're going to sentence him to four to five years in a state prison for the kidnapping charge. And while Mm -hmm. he's there for that, we're going to look into some other stuff. Mm -hmm. So police report that evidence found confirms that a skeleton found in the backyard of the house was actually John. In the backyard of like Dee Dee's house? I believe so. Dee Dee was, yeah, the mom. Yeah. And unfortunately, Dee Dee passed away not knowing what happened to her son. March 2011, he was charged with John Sohus's murder. John's truck ends up in Connecticut when a man named Christopher Crow was selling it to a minister's son. So, Christopher so Crow. police found out that Christopher Crow was not Christopher Crow. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, Mr. Son, you got duped. Mr. Son. Mr. Yeah. Son, you got duped and this isn't your car. 
So on April 10th, 2013, Gerhard Schreischmeider <laughs> was convicted by a Los Angeles jury of first degree murder for John, but they couldn't find Linda, so they they couldn't convict him of that murder, but they do believe that Linda's dead. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And he was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Two defense experts testified that they diagnosed him with a delusional disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. One of the experts, Dr. Keith Ablo, testified that Chris told him that his father had been emotionally abusive during his childhood. Another doctor, James Chu, a psychiatrist for the prosecution, testified that he had diagnosed Chris with a mixed personality disorder with narcissistic and antisocial traits. But he felt he had exaggerated his symptoms of mental illness and was capable of knowing right from wrong. And he even, like, said that he had planned all these details of the abduction. So he was just like, he clearly had. Take this with a grain of salt. Yeah, like, take my diagnosis with a grain of salt. This man knows what he's doing. I just can't imagine the kind of stress it would have to be to live like that. Yeah. Keeping up with all of those wild personalities. I mean, you're just moving from what they do next, basically. And all these wives. Also, like, you're getting married and you're like, I'm going to change my last name. I'm a Rockefeller. (laughs) No, but you're not. No. Ooh. But yeah, like, you're not building any life that you're going to, like, grow. Right. So it really is. It's just like that movie. What's that Leonardo DiCaprio movie? Catch Me If You Can. Yes. Where it's like, you're just going from one identity to the next. Oh, my God. And that's another that's your... another real story. That's a good one. Frank Abernathy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, why? Why? What are you doing? Yeah. This is just how you're going to live. Right. You had such a with weird. nothing real ever. Childhood with your dad being the way that he was, that you created this scenario in your head. So you become a doctor. You become. Well, if that's even true about his right. dad. Right. I mean, yeah. who knows? Exactly. Hmm. Cheech Chester. It's a good name. Mm-hmm. It's a good name. Yeah. Gerhard Streismeister. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you for telling that story. You're so welcome. With all those names. Uh-huh. <laughs> You'll have so much fun with those. I can't wait for people to write in and be like, actually, it's this. This is a, it's actually pronounced Smith. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I'm all gonna, those other letters were silent. I'm going to keep saying this. So. <laughs> You're all welcome. <laughs> so we'll have episodes next week uh-huh. and then nothing new for two weeks. So just be ready. Yeah. In the meantime, check out the podcast store. That's lots of new merch. Yes. Join the Patreon and get all those back. You get instant access to everything that's been posted right. up to that point. Plus, we'll be as doing well as going Patreon forward. feeds, too. Yeah. The Patreon, you guys are still going to get we'll everything sure that you pay for. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. Right. We love you so much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.